The wanted poster became an iconic symbol of the American West as the opportunities of a new land made legends of both outlaws and of those who worked to stop them. In 1903, Thomas Edison had a movie made, The Great Train Robbery. And it lasted basically 20 minutes, but that was a new page in making movies at that time. Number one, it was lengthy, a lot longer than others, and they were using outlaws of the West robbing a train and had everything in it. You know, detaching the, the rail cars from the train, uh, beating up the station agent, a fight on top of the, one of the cars, explosions, gunfights, the whole thing. That can probably be looked at as the beginning of the Western movies and what they should contain. It set the, the trend for them that is still followed even into the 21st century. The outline of that movie and all that action fits quite well in the story of the train robbery in 1877 in Big Springs, Nebraska. It was one of the biggest train robberies that ever happened, and one of the early ones. A crew robbed a uh, Union Pacific train at Big Springs, Nebraska. They got about $60,000. But the story is that there were some Texas drovers that delivered some cattle. They got paid for the herd because the head of the drive supposedly was a, a cowboy by the name of Joel Collins. Allegedly, after they were paid for the herd, they partied, gambled, and everything, they were out of money, and yet they still had to pay for what the herd brought because these were contract drovers. It didn't, they didn't own the herd. They got word that there was a paymaster coming through on the railroad, so they devised a plan to stop the train near Big Springs, Nebraska. But they devised this plan to separate the engine and the tender away from the car. Uh, they went into the station and beat up the station agent and had him a, a captive and maybe another helper in there. And allegedly they robbed the passengers also. So anyway, they went to the pay car and they couldn't find anything, it was a mail car. There were some wooden boxes with big iron reinforcements. One of the gang was really mad so he grabbed a, the fire ax and he hit one of these boxes and freshly minted $20 gold pieces came out of these boxes. Oh, wow, what a deal. Well, when they left there, they came down across uh, northwest Kansas. So here we have six guys going three different directions. At least two of them came through here. And those we have the evidence for because Joel Collins and Bill Heffridge uh, were killed uh, in Kansas. They stopped at Buffalo Park, which is in Gulf County, and the sheriff from Hayes was there looking for them. And there was also a, a uh, company of uh, troops there from uh, Fort Hayes. The sheriff had a, a jurisdiction along there and he was a near sheriff. And so in the foggy morning, these guys rode into Buffalo not realizing they were there and they were killed. And uh, about $20,000 of the 60,000 was recovered. But just three miles west and two south of the Cottonwood Ranch was a ranch called the Museum Ranch. They recovered $20,000 worth of gold coins. The legend still is that it was buried at Museum Ranch. And so you think of it realistically, if that happened in the 1870s when $20,000 would have been an unbelievable amount of money for the settlers, few settlers in western Kansas, why didn't they go look for it? It seemed like in Kansas, uh, when I was traveling the state a whole lot, every, every county has a buried gold story somewhere. The gold has never been found, but the legend goes on. That Wild West was such a short period of time in the expanse of history, but it was a time that uh, was unusual. It, you know, the, the eastern part was settled and, quote, civilized, and so this type of activity 
where you had these lawmen and these these outlaws competing for territory and, and, uh, and vying against each other. And there were a lot of things happening in northwestern Kansas in the early days. Uh, a lot of the counties were adjoined with other counties until the population got big enough to get their own county commissioners, their own county sheriffs and stuff. If you go back to about 1869, when the railroad first came in, prior to that, there wasn't really any law enforcement. It was just, uh, you might have a United States Marshal come through, Deputy Marshal. But uh, in 69, the nearest organized law enforcement was in Ellis County. So this area was served by the sheriff of Ellis County. Now they had troops at Fort Wallace, but of course they had the Posse Comitatus Act. They, they couldn't become involved unless they were requested by civil authorities. The little town of Sheridan that was in the track for the Kansas Pacific Railroad, Union Pacific Railroad Eastern Division, their law enforcement was a vigilance committee. Where the cattle towns, say Dodge City and Ellsworth, and a lot of those towns had uh, sheriffs that were or city marshals that what we would call a shootist. You know, they relied on their, their, their sidearm quite a bit. So it was kind of an evolution from, you know, after the, after the Civil War, most of the people that settled this area were veterans, and they were well capable of, of handling things on their own. And when there wasn't any organized law enforcement, the, the vigilance committee, usually made up of the businessmen of a town, would, would see that things were, were kept in order. So that's kind of how it developed out here. Then the counties became organized and, and uh, the sheriff became the premier law enforcement officer in the county. When the county was organized, the townships, each township could have had a justice of the peace and a constable, one or more, uh, that were elected in that township. And they basically prosecuted and uh, arrested on local crimes within the township. The, the biggest demand on a local uh, peace officer was just that, to keep the peace and to collect taxes. Part of their salary was based on how much of the taxes they could collect. So they were pretty, pretty proficient tax collectors. <laughs> then one step up from that would have been the uh, county sheriff, which had jurisdiction over the entire county once the county was organized and there would have been a, what they called at that time a probate judge that had jurisdiction on the, the, the smaller civil probate cases and the criminal cases. And then above the, pro, the county uh, probate judge would have been a district court judge, which was a traveling judge. When I first became judge, the 15th Judicial District, which is what Sheridan County is in, was Sherman, Thomas, Sheridan, Graham, and Rooks. The judge traveled those counties. The district judges came through once a month, once every two months on what they called motion day, and they would hear the felonies, the, the major civil cases and that the district judge heard. But they were uh, somewhat, I guess you could say, social events as, as shown by pictures that we have of a trial that occurred in uh, 1923. It was standing room only in the courtroom. In fact, people were standing up here on the south side of the judge's bench. Well, it had public interest. It was a, a lady sued her in-laws for calling her a not very good wife. Wow. But it was basically, as you can see, they were social events. And there are other pictures where there were lots and lots of people at trials. Well, the one thing that kind of always has a, uh, somewhat amazed me or is most every community around here that has an older courthouse like ours, something built in the early 1900s or late 1800s, would have been rel relatively elaborate for the time. I mean, you look at the, the cornices and the, the marble, the tile floors. Well, the window out here in the, in the hallway, that piece of art glass, the county paid $450 for that piece of glass and put it in a $60,000 building, which would have been quite an expenditure for the time. But people, it, I think it was a source of pride. The first courthouse burned. That courthouse burned in June of 1896. The fire was started by taking the books out of the register of deeds safe, spreading them around the courthouse and lighting them afire. The courthouse burned down. The county treasurer's safe was broken into, and I forget how much, there's $1,000, $1,500 stolen. One of the 
main suspects was a man by the name of W.S. Cuisenberry. At the time of the fire, he was moving, hauling a load of pool tables from Colorado Springs to Cripple Creek. But they, the county, they thought he was one of the people involved in setting that fire because he had been, if I'm not mistaken, the county register of deeds prior to the fire being set. And he had a set of books, some what set of books that he offered to sell to the county. He was such a main suspect that the county actually hired a police officer from Colorado Springs to follow him and to intercept his incoming and outgoing mail. And he hand copied those letters from Cuisenberry and the people sending them to him. And they, at one time, were down in the county clerk's office, the, the letters that that police officer sent back to the county. But where he was in Colorado Springs, I know that you could, there were several trains that came through here. You'd get in Colorado Springs within a, within a day. Right. Or night or several yeah. hours. In addition to that, uh, Mr. Cuisenberry and a lady by the name of Kate Clark, they were charged in the early 1900s with running body houses in Hoxie on three separate locations. They uh, were found not guilty. He was also charged with uh, providing locations and providing alcohol during the prohibition times and he was found not guilty on that. I, he, he was never convicted of anything that, that I found in the records but he, he, he had a reputation. There were a number of bootleggers, what the so-called bootleggers, they're not, they didn't make alcohol. They brought alcohol into Kansas because Kansas was a dry state. The federal prohibition ended, but Kansas stayed dry longer. And it was fairly common practice, and they'd go to McCook and they'd buy a couple cases of whiskey or whatever they had orders for, put them in the bottom of the truck, and then cover it up with corn and bring it back and pass it out. So it had two different types of corn coming. Right, back. there was corn and corn. <laughs> Processed corn and, and unprocessed corn. corn. Yeah. <laughs> Every community uh, had their stories that went along with the lawmen and the outlaws. We here in Oberlin had our share in Decatur County, which brings us to Oberlin's first jail. As a report in the June 24th, 1885 Oberlin Herald, the Oberlin City Jail has been completed. The 16 by 14 by seven high structure is made of, of a two by four spike together, two windows and one door. The floor is made up of two by sixes turned on edge. This door was, when it was closed, the deputy or the sheriff could look around the corners. It was used until about, oh, 1890, 1900, when it was moved out to the poor farm. The county commissioners in 1905 voted to let the overseer out at the poor farm use it for a hospital for the insane. Hayes was known as kind of a rough place at one point in time, 1867 when it was founded. There are quite a few ruffians out here. A few of them would steal animals from Fort Hayes, mules, horses, and they'd transport them up north near where is now Rooks County. Some of them got interesting nicknames. John Pony Donovan led his own gang of horse thieves up through Horse Thief Canyon. He was killed in town here by one of his own people, supposedly, and buried in Boot Hill. One of the more unsavory characters from early Oberlin was a horse trader named John Henry. He uh, had a crew of seven to 10 guys with him. A lot of times they would come to town and terrorize the citizens. And uh, if you crossed him, they would beat you pretty bad. Charlie Ayers was a 21-year-old kid, and he was uh, appointed sheriff, elected sheriff. He was known as the uh, boy sheriff of Kansas. He kept pretty good control on the town, and John Henry hated him because of that. One day they met in the drugstore, and uh, John Henry was trying to egg on the young sheriff and trying to get him to do something, and Charlie Ayers wouldn't do anything, and he went to the barber shop. John Henry went into another attorney's office, and knowing that he could rile him up, he fired a shot into the floor and got the sheriff to jump out of the barber chair, come running down the street. And as the sheriff went to the door, there John Henry was and took a shot at him. He missed, the sheriff fired back and hit him. 
and then shook off another one of John Henry's accomplices and shot him again and John Henry fell into the sidewalk where he died. Hi there, my name is Ian Trevath and I'm the Education Director here at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. So you may not think directly of paleontology when we talk about sort of the Wild West, but as it turns out, there was a feud that ran all across the Western United States between two well-known early American paleontologists, Marsh and Cope. The very, very beginnings of that rivalry actually kicked off here in Western Kansas at a place called Fort Wallace. There was a long-necked plesiosaur called an elasmosaur that was excavated, and that was sent to uh, our friend E.D. Cope, who was in such a hurry to describe it and name a new species, he actually got the head on the wrong end of the body. Well, his friend at the time, but soon to be rival, O.C. Marsh pointed out that he thought maybe the anatomy wasn't quite lining up, and he brought Joseph Lady, who was the preeminent anatomist of the time, and Lady kind of looked at it and said, yep, you got the head on the wrong end. So this is kind of what touched off the rivalry between Marsh and Cope, and would eventually culminate in what we know as the Bone Wars, uh, where they would literally be sniping each other across the Badlands, they would be blowing up excavation sites, they would be stealing each other's finds at the, at the train station, all sorts of skullduggery going on there. So the Wild West even applied to science. It even applies to science. A pretty interesting story about the banker. His name was MacPherson, and he had the Bank of Nicodemus here. When the railroads created the town of Bogue, he um, took people's deposits and then took off and went to uh, Oklahoma. A lady by the name of um, Eliza Smith, who had a hotel here, he skipped town with her money and she found him down in Oklahoma. But somehow or another, he convinced her that, you know, he was establishing the bank and as soon as he got everything straight, she would have access to her money. And so then she left and nothing happened. And so she went back down there and then she couldn't find him. One case in particular involved a, a great uncle of mine. Uh, his last name was Barber. He was working as a uh, ranch hand and there was a neighbor that had some sheep and they didn't like the sheep at all. So uh, Barber and a fellow from Missouri went over and just shot this sheep herder down right in his front door of his study. We look at the old west and we see the bank robbers and the train robbers and they always call for a posse. The sheriff and the marshal need a posse. But in 1962, Trigo County needed their own posse. Galen Geyer was actually on the posse and helped find and hunt down the two fugitives. We were hunting for a, a uh, older boy and a girl that had killed the undersheriff and shot the sheriff. And they figured he had left the country and shot the girl and we were supposed to be running the road ditches and farmstead looking for a dead body. Well, lo and behold, we found them both alive. I went in the building, I was in the building, I lifted up the wrong end of the crate. Uh, he wasn't on my end and probably a good thing. Charlie Martin went in and he got a hold of the other side and lifted it up. He came out stuttering and I could hardly talk. We all scattered. The highway patrolman had one of these bull horns and he hollered down there, he's come on out. Nothing happened. An old man, 80 years old, which his name was Elisha Garrett, he stepped out and he says, come on out of there, we're going to blow this building off the top of you. Waited a few seconds, the girl came out. A little bit later, the door opened again and he was the meanest looking guy I ever seen in my life. Put him in the patrol car and it was only like less than five miles from town, but when we got to the courthouse, that courthouse was just lined up with people. Couldn't believe it. This was the last posse in The last Kansas? posse that's ever been held in the state of Kansas. Alexander Ramsey was known as a, as a good man. He was a courageous individual who tracked down horse thieves and uh,
people who stole stock off of the railroad here in Hayes City. Ramsey lost his life to a man named Jim Dean. A gunfire erupted when Sheriff Ramsey called him out and Jim fired the first shot. Uh, it hit Ramsey's horse in the neck and the horse reared up and then he got another shot off on Ramsey and it hit Ramsey in the stomach. He returned fire and it hit Jim Dean in the heart and in the head with this gun here. Unfortunately, an hour later, Alexander Ramsey had passed away. Mary had a premonition that Alex had been killed. After Alex dies, her will to live was no longer as strong. She had tuberculosis, having a fatal disease, and knowing the despair that hit her from her husband passing away meant that she lasted not too long after that, about 10 days and was buried alongside him at Mount Allen Cemetery. There are two of the earliest graves there. Everything that Alexander Ramsey had done, you would see in popular cinema now. He went after train robbers, he went after uh, horse thieves, he went after murderers, went after just about everybody. There's some kind of a charm about that era, the Wild West and the, and the, and the outlaw and the lawman that is just kind of a, a unique phase in our, our history. Some of the, the lawmen, they were pretty tough characters. You know, a lot of them were, had been veterans either of the Civil War or World War I. And they weren't going to put up with any nonsense. Uh, some of them had reputations of being tough and shoot first and ask questions later. And uh, some law officers didn't carry guns. They depended on their, their fists or their tongue. Uh, law enforcement uh, or, or the peace officers, the, when, once the community developed, then they, they were just family men in the community that would accept the badge or the star and uh, do what they could to keep, keep the peace. For 57 years, I've been associated with what we now call law enforcement. I think that the most fulfilling part of it was just the feeling that you were helping someone, that if you could help them through the crisis that they were in, or try to talk them down from a situation. You know, I, I can remember uh, one time I had a young man who was, was all drunk up and he had a gun and, and he was going to shoot me. So I walked up and took his gun away. Uh, knowing. You know, you had a, a kind of a relationship with the people that you knew. You knew he wasn't going to do it. Well, you hoped he wasn't going to do it. But, uh, you know, and, and did I bring him to jail? No. I talked to him, got his parents involved. And I think there was more of a, an idea of helping people instead of getting him involved in a system that was going to have consequences that were were not the best for the family or for that individual involved. Law enforcement or being a peace officer is, is an interesting career. You have a chance to help people. You also, you know, I, I always operated under the philosophy, the first time I'll give you a break if it's nothing serious. Second time I'll give you a, a verbal warning. Third time you're mine. <laughs> Thank you.